Hi friends, this is Dr. Ralph Wilson with the Jesus Walk Bible Study Series. We're studying Behold the Lamb of God. This is Lesson 3, The Lamb Who Redeems Us from Slavery. It's based on 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. Let me read it for you. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Let's pray together. Father, as we study today, we pray that your Spirit might be working in our hearts and me as I communicate, that Jesus Christ might be seen. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, so far in our study of the Lamb of God, we've looked at basic ideas of sacrifice in Lesson 1, and then specifically at the concept of substitutionary atonement by the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 in Lesson 2. This week, we'll examine the theme of ransom and the redemption of slaves. Of course, uh, the ideas of redemption and ransom are not separate from the themes of sacrifice the Passover lamb, the servant of Isaiah 53, they're quite interwoven. But I think you'll find it valuable to trace the role of the Lamb of God as a redeemer, one who sets the slaves free. This is our theme verse again, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We live in a world where slavery is nearly abolished, but the ancient world of the Old and New Testaments, slavery was all too prevalent. One way to define slavery is involuntary servitude, subjecting one person to the power of another. Most slaves were considered chattel, that is, property that can be bought and sold. Slavery came about through warfare, piracy, brigandage, the international slave trade, kidnapping, infant exposure, failure to pay a debt, forced labor of alien populations, natural reproduction of the existing slave population, and the mines or gladiatorial con combat. Of these, warfare seems to be the main source of slaves. As Roman armies expanded the empire, and carried out wars to reinforce their control. In urban areas of Roman imperial society, the slave population was considerable, perhaps between 17 and 33 percent. The early church itself grew largely among the slave population, so slavery is a common topic in the New Testament. But slavery had Old Testament roots as well. Slavery was part of Israel's national memory, the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt as an alien people, stripped of their rights and subjected to forced labor in building cities for Pharaoh. Well, let's pause for a moment and look at discussion question one. In the New Testament world, what class of humans was freed by payment of a redemption price or ransom? Why do you think that Jesus, Peter, and Paul used this analogy in this week's theme verses? What aspect of the Christian life does slavery help explain? Pause your DVD now and discuss it, and then resume when you're ready. In the midst of Egypt, Yahweh hears the cry of the Israelites and prepares to deliver Israel from Egypt. Exodus 6, 6, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. The concept of kinsman redeemer mentioned in this passage is firmly rooted in Israel's law and tradition especially seen in the story of Ruth and Boaz, for example. The Hebrew verb ga'al means to redeem, revenge, avenge, ransom, and do the part of a kinsman. The very strong sense of family 
gave kinsmen a responsibility to look out for their close relatives, such as marrying a brother's widow if no children had yet been born, in order to raise up children in the brother's name, which was the main issue in the case of Ruth and Boaz. Purchasing family lands that had to be sold because of poverty in order to keep the land in the family. Buying the freedom of relatives who had become slaves because of debts they couldn't pay. Avenging a kinsman who was murdered. Rescuing someone who was kidnapped. All those things were the responsibility of a kinsman. Frequently, the noun goel and the verb ga'al refer to Yahweh himself, who acts as a kinsman to the Israelites to rescue, redeem, and avenge them when they are in trouble. Another common word for redemption is pada, ransom, rescue, deliver. The basic meaning of the Hebrew root is to achieve the transfer of ownership from one to another through the payment of a price or the equivalent substitute. A third word, the noun koper, ransom, which we considered in Lesson 2, comes from the verb kapar, which means to atone by offering a substitute. Well, let's pause again. This is discussion question two. What comparisons do you see between Jesus and the role of the Old Testament type of the kinsman redeemer? Pause the DVD now and then turn it back on again when you finish your discussion. Well, with this Old Testament background to the concept of slavery, redemption, and ransom, let's examine our New Testament texts. Let me read for the third time our theme text from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The obvious analogy here is to a slave that is to be redeemed by payment of a ransom price. A key word in this verse, redeemed or ransomed, is the verb lutrao, to free by paying a ransom, redeem, a word widely used in the first century of manumission or freeing of slaves or prisoners of war. In case of slaves, the lutron, or ransom, was temporarily deposited in the shrine of a god whose property the slave became by a legal fiction. Christians, in this verse, are ransomed from an empty way of life. The author contrasts the normal monetary ransom price with this one. On the one hand, silver and gold are perishable or corruptible, subject to decay or destruction. On the other hand, Christ's blood is precious. It's the Greek adjective timios, pertaining to being of exceptional value, costly, precious, of great worth or value. However, freedom from slavery is not the only idea in this verse. The theme of sacrifice is present too, since the phrase, without blemish or defect, echoes the requirement that sacrifices to Yahweh must be whole and not crippled or disabled in any way. The principle being that we offer our best to God, not that which is second best or not of full value. New Testament writers didn't invent the idea of Christ's death providing a ransom or redemption price. Jesus himself said it, Mark 10, 44-45, which we've looked at before. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The idea of substitution is very clear in Mark 10, 45, because the Greek preposition on T, which indicates in place of or instead of. As we noted in Lesson 2, this passage carries clear echoes of Isaiah 53. Now, some liberal scholars argue that these could not be Jesus' own words, that they sound too Pauline, that the early church must have put these words in Jesus' mouth. But such objections seem to stem from a distaste for the concept of sacrifice, 
rather than a viable argument against the authenticity of Jesus' words. There is much more that could be said about this verse, but let's move on to our third theme verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. This passage makes it clear that Christians, like slaves, have been bought, and God now owns them. Bought is the Greek verb agorazo, to acquire things or services in exchange for money, by purchase. The idea extends to persons as well, to secure the rights to someone by paying a price, by, acquire as property. This concept is used five other times in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 7.23, You were bought at a price, do not become slaves of men. Acts 20.28, 20, Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. 2 Peter 2.1, False prophets deny the sovereign Lord who bought them. Revelation 5.9, And they sang a new song. You were worthy to take the scroll and open the seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And then finally in Revelation 14.4, the 144,000 follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Well, let's pause again, this time discussion question 3, based on 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. How should we disciples apply the principle, you are not your own, you were bought with a price? How should this affect our living? Pause the DVD now and then resume it when you finish your discussion. We are tracing the ransomed slave analogy in this lesson. The New Testament constantly intermixes this theme with that of sacrifice and atonement for sin. Nevertheless, let's examine the ransomed slave analogy a bit further and look at each element in the analogy in the following table. Across the top you have four verses. On the side you've got various themes. You'll notice uh, slaves, you for many, the church of God, people. The form of slavery in one of the passages is an empty way of life. The ransom price is Christ's blood, Jesus' life, his own blood, lamb's blood. And the one who pays the ransom, uh, where it's stated, would be Jesus' God or the lamb. But notice the line where nothing is, that is, the one to whom the ransom is paid. It's not given. God is clearly the owner now, but to whom is the ransom paid? We aren't told, because the New Testament writers don't carry the analogy that far. We'll see why in a moment. Our key passages only hint at what we are freed from, an empty way of life, 1 Peter 1.18. But the New Testament is quite clear on this in other passages. Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin, John 8.34. Paul explored this theme in his letters, Galatians 4.9. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Titus 3.3. 3. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. And then Romans 6, 17, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And then Romans 6, 22, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. The slavery, obviously, is to sin. We find it habitual and cannot escape even by our best efforts. We can identify with Paul's famous cry of despair 
in Romans chapter 7. Let me read to you Romans 7, 21 to 25. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I, myself, and my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Our sin separates us and estranges us from God and makes us easy for Satan to deceive. Our sin makes us hopelessly in debt to God, far beyond our ability to repay. Sin has captured us in two ways. One, sin's addictive power entraps us in continual disobedience to God. And two, God's justice requires that this continual habitual disobedience be punished. We are rightly under a sentence of judgment for our disobedience. <laughs> We're in very deep, friends, way over our heads. We need to be rescued from this plight. A savior, a rescuer, a miracle is our only hope. Now remember back, none of our key passages spell out clearly who receives the ransom. Since God owns us, the slave ransom analogy breaks down at this point, since it is God paying a ransom to God, and that would confuse the picture. And that's why the Bible authors drop it there. Surely, Satan doesn't receive a ransom. Well, some of the early church fathers explored a so-called devil ransom theory, but it doesn't really work. The Bible depicts Jesus' salvation as a victorious battle with the forces of evil, personified in Satan or the devil. But nowhere in Scripture is Satan seen as the legitimate owner of sinful people. He keeps them in darkness and holds them in his deceitful power. But he is not their legitimate owner. He is a usurper and thief, an accuser of the brethren. Satan loses his power not because he has been paid off, but because we have been forgiven. We can no longer accurately be accused of sin. When we realize that truth, we are set free and no longer hopeless and manipulated by Satan's lies. Paul puts it this way, Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. We are also given a new way of pleasing God. No longer trying to obey God's law by our own flawed efforts, but learning to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's pause again for discussion. According to the slave ransom analogy, who is the slave? What is he enslaved by? Who offers the ransom? If Satan is involved in the enslaving process, why isn't the ransom paid to him? And then why isn't the slave ransom analogy spelled out completely in the New Testament? Pause now for this and then we'll have another question right after it. Discussion question five I'm offering this for extra credit, but uh, try to answer it. In what sense have we been set free or released from slavery to sin? Why do we need the Holy Spirit to help us keep this freedom? Turn off the DVD now and discuss it, and then turn it on again when you're finished. This theme of deliverance from slavery is powerful, teaching us several things. One, 
God is our kinsman redeemer who takes responsibility for us. Two, God loves us radically. He will not let us go. He resorts to extreme measures to restore us to himself. Even the death of his son, whatever it takes, our God will do for us. He is committed to us. Three, we now belong to God. What we do is not just our own business. We are God's. Four, but we are love slaves who voluntarily, freely serve God. The analogy of slavery and ransom finally merges into atonement for sins. Let me read our theme verse again from 1 Peter 1, 18-19. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your awesome love that sets me free through Jesus Christ. I am still amazed when I try to think through it all. My mind is boggled by some things I don't understand, but my heart is full of love and appreciation for your great gift to me and all my brothers and sisters. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. May God richly bless you.